Welcome back to week eight tides. And in video two, we are going to move forward and take a closer look at how tides are measured and predicted. So how are they measured? Well, we use tide gauges. And uh, you can see a couple variations here. Uh, basically, a tide gauge is a device that measures and records the height of average sea level at a specific location. It'll also measure the height of high tide, height of the low tide, and kind of variations in between. We'll periodically be recording the water level as time goes on. So we have a few different variations here. We've got kind of old school uh, way of, of measuring this. At, and you can see the same feature at low tide and then again at high tide with uh, um, a ruler here on the edge of it so you can just spot it with the naked eye. And then now um, we have a little bit more modern technology uh, where we can measure the highs and low tides and then um, send that data to um, a satellite, to a database, and just constantly be recording it. So some of the data that we get, you can see this graph down here where we have fluctuations in water level um, throughout uh, several days, which is pretty neat. So we measure the highs and lows based on these tide gauges, which basically just periodically measures the changes in sea level. So how do we predict um, and what do we get? Um, so we get these tide tables because of predictions that we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, but we, we get these tide tables that show the day, the time of the high, the low, and then the numerical change in water level for a specific location. Um, so th these tide tables are predictions. So we use the data that was collected from these tide gauges, some historical data for the area. We use our knowledge of moon cycles and tide cycles to create these tide tables, which is pretty neat stuff. So this linked NOAA tide tables, we pull that up, and you guys can take a closer look at these if you're going to the coast. Scroll down and you can see the coast split up by different locations. And we can look at predicted 2012 tide forecast for these different areas. We can look at the current water levels versus current tides at different locations. And we can get real-time Columbia River tides as well. So this is important for mariners and, and people that are traveling in and out or visiting the coast. So if we click on uh, for instance, let's go to Brookings. And we click on Brookings and what we get is a tide um, graph. And we also see in the corner here uh, the highs and lows. So on the first, which is today, we've got a at 5.52 a.m. we have a low um, tide at 11 or 12:22 p.m. we have a high tide and it tells you how high or low that tide is going to be and those numbers are in feet so we can determine how high or low those tides are so the uh, the next bit here that we can look at are tide curves and um, same length no tide graphs to get to these curves so we this curve is a predicted curve uh, based on these tide tables and uh, past data and our knowledge of the area, what the, the coastline basins like, what the latitude is, and what the moon cycles are like at that specific location. And so when we look at the, that tide chart here, we can see the highs, the lows, highs, lows. And you can see here this location has um, two different lows two different times um, on the same day, but they're very different. One is a much lower low than the other. So if you're going tide pooling to look at critters, you want to go at the lower of the low tides because you're going to get to see more stuff. So this is pretty cool. You can get a, um, a snapshot view of what the tides are going to be like at specific locations. And um, in different areas on the Oregon coast, your tides are going to behave differently. So you're going to have high and low tides at different times of the day. So keep that in mind when you're going to the coast. So these are two important things uh, to look for. Um, when we look at these graphs and look at the tides that are predicted for an area or that are measured for an area, we can categorize them based on um, when and how high or low these tides are. So we have 
what's called a diurnal tide in the very bottom. Um, so in one tidal day, 24 hour period here, we have one high or low in one lunar day. So that's just one, one high, one low. Semi-diurnal tide it means there's two highs or two lows in one lunar day. So here you can see one lunar or tidal day here, two lows and two highs in that. And then a mixed tide would be a combination of the semi-diurnal and then fluctuating our um, numbers for how high or how low that tide is. So we have two highs and two lows in one lunar day, but our highs and our lows are very different in height. So our first low, much lower. Our second low is much higher. So a significant difference there. So that would be considered a mixed tide. So if we go back here and take a look at our Brookings data, what would you say that is? Diurnal, semi-diurnal, or mixed? Hmm. I'll let you guys think about that, and hopefully you'll uh, bring any questions to lab that you have, because we're going to be looking closer at this um, and looking at some data um, in your homework assignment for this week. So those are the types of tides that we see. So why is it important for us to know when these highs and lows are happening? Um, how do we predict these tides? Well, we predict them based on our knowledge of the Earth, Moon, and Sun system, or the rotation of the Earth around the Sun and the Moon around the Earth. So knowing the cycles when we have a full moon, when we have a, a, a new moon, we can use that to help us predict when our highs and lows are going to be. We also need to know about the local area. So we need to know what the basin's like, what the depth is like, and where we are in latitude, because those all get factored into these values for highs and lows. We can also factor in past tide data, so we can look at patterns that we've seen uh, recorded by those um, tide gauges and compare that to what we are actually seeing and predicting. So why is this important? Um, well, in areas like uh, the San Francisco Bay here, where we have a pretty high change in our tides from high to low, pretty busy shipping port. In this situation here, this um, link, this why is it important link, if you click on that, you'll get to this page um, where this barge was carrying some um, equipment needed and they had to go at the lowest low tide and when they did that um, they knew exactly how high this boat was, they knew how um, how high it was going to be floating in the water, how high the water was going to be and they cleared this bridge, you can see in this picture here, by six feet. Enormous ship clearing this bridge by only six feet. Pretty amazing um, calculations there for that. And if you're interested, if you click on that why is it important link, you can read more about this scenario here um, because it can be pretty important. Um, this um, transporting these cranes on the ship, um, uh, $1.25 million um, going underneath this Oakland Bridge on this ship. Um, and it was about 220 feet tall, and they cleared it by only six feet. Pretty amazing stuff. So it's important to know um, where you're going and what things are going to be like. Not only is this um, important for things like going under bridges, but also if you're traveling through an area that at low tide is exposed, you're going to have a hard time getting back to your port. There's um, places in the Bay of Fundy where um, they, if they're going fishing or out lobster fishing, they have to basically live by the tides because when um, the tide is out, some of their boats are high and dry. So for example, um, high tide, you can easily get to your ship and you can easily get it out into the bay. Low tide, it's a different story. Um, your boat is left high and dry when the tide is out. So these fishermen or lobstermen have to depend and know when the tide is high and when it's going to be low. If they're out in the ocean and they don't make it back to their dock at high tide, they're stuck out there for another 12 hours until they um, can make it back in with the next high tide. So it's pretty important in areas where these tidal ranges are 
just so absolutely huge and enormous. So that uh, wraps it up for um, how tides are measured and predicted. We'll come back in the next video and talk about what causes tides.